Well, thank you very much. And I thank you for coming out to talk about the sanctuary. I don't blame anyone that's out enjoying the beauty of uh, the surroundings of this uh, wonderful place. But uh, thank you for coming to talk about the sanctuary. And just so you'll know what's in store for this afternoon, we have a little bit of uh, cerebral, some heavy cerebral stuff for just a little while. Because there's, as I mentioned this morning, there's one, one part of the Bible that is used the most to, to argue that the Adventist understanding of, of the sanctuary is simply not biblical. And that's from the book of Hebrews. And so I just want to share with you some, some exciting stuff that, that has, has gotten me uh, charged with greater assurance that this message is solid. Uh, so we have as our theme this weekend from Psalm 27, where David went into the sanctuary to behold the beauty of the Lord, and we saw that for the first service. And then uh, we, for the church service, we talked about uh, the good news of Yom Kippur, uh, because later in Psalm 27, he talked about the goodness of the Lord, and then he also said David wanted to see not only the beauty of the Lord, but he wanted to inquire in his temple. And he uses the word there, a special word for inquire, which in Hebrew means to dig deep, mm. to test to whether something is true or not. So that's what we're going to do for the next little bit. We're going to do some digging deep to see, does this message really, can it be grounded? Uh, and I, I come with this as one who almost left the Adventist church back in the wake of the Desmond Ford crisis. You know, I had just been, a, I just finished my doctoral studies and I was sent off to Israel for some postdoctoral work because I was the first one that graduated from Andrews with a degree that was going to actually then teach at Andrews. And they weren't sure whether they could really trust that I had learned enough at Andrews to teach at Andrews. You know, can, is, our, is our own product good enough to be able to be here? So they sent me off to Israel for a few months just to get a little, a little extra. And I came back rested after dissertation and the weariness that I had there and uh, came back with a beard, which I've had ever since. But I also came back to a surprise because during the time that I was gone is when uh, the Glacier View uh, meeting took place in, in, in Colorado and Desmond Ford had been writing his 991 page manuscript and basically the storm had broken in the Adventist church over the sanctuary message. And so I was coming back off of my postdoctoral study leave. And in those days, there were no cell phones. There were no text messages. It cost a fortune just to call for three minutes to home. And so I knew nothing what was happening here. I was blissfully ignorant of the, <laughs> of the catastrophe that was exploding <laughs> upon our church. I came back home. I was going to start teaching at the seminary in about three or four weeks after I got home. And here was a knock on my door and my very best theological friend came with a stack of books to welcome me home. And he put these stack of books on my uh, dining room table, and he basically said, I dare you to read these and stay an Adventist. I said, what do you mean? We've gone through thick and thin together. What are you doing? He said, I've been studying these last eight or nine months, and I am convinced the Adventist message of the sanctuary is not true. And so I'm leaving. And sure enough, he did. And he wanted me to come with him. He wanted to start a new church, a gospel church. Get rid of this investigative judgment that you lose your assurance of salvation when you believe that kind of stuff. And so he was gone. A few weeks later, he had resigned from the seminary. A few weeks later, he had turned in his credentials as an Adventist minister. And a few weeks later, he had returned in his membership and resigned from the church. 
and I was left with a stack of books and a first year of teaching at the seminary. Any teachers here? You remember the time when you first, your, your first year of teaching, when you're trying to keep ahead of your students? And when you're trying to do that with seminary students, <laughs> it's even worse. And so I was preparing my lectures, but I was also trying to read this stuff. Well, the one on top was the 991 page manuscript by Des Ford. So I started reading it. And, you know, I'd prepare my lectures at my office, and then I'd come home, and for a little light bedtime reading, before turning off the light at night, I would pick up Des Ford's manuscript. And I started finding all these questions I didn't have answers for. I started getting more and more morose, till finally one night, my wife, who was not yet into theology herself. She was, had a music background. She was a music teacher. But she was a mom then. With a, we had a, a small child at that time. She f turned to me one night and said, would you please put that stuff away? You are so hard to live with these days. We can't even stand you around the house. And I didn't realize what it had done to me. So I obeyed her. And I took it out of the bedroom and took, snuck it to my office, because I had to read it. I knew that bright seminary students like Seth were going to be coming and ask me, what does this mean? And I had no clue how to answer them. And I also came, ultimately came to the decision, if this doctrine of the sanctuary is really, it's, we call it our, the, the, the heart of Adventism, the, the foundation of our faith, it's what got us started, and it's our one unique doctrine that we have, and if it's not true, why would I want to be an Adventist? Lots of other Sabbath-keeping, Saturday-keeping, people that believe in the state of the dead like we do, people that have a, prophet, a prophetess or a prophet that I could go to their church. What? So, you know, other people don't feel like I. They feel like, well, they can throw away the sanctuary and still keep Adventism. But for me, it, was, it, it seemed like it was the heart of everything. And so, so I decided if I get all the tools I can and study and I can't find evidence to support this, I'm out of here. Because I don't want to be an Adventist just because my pastor taught me. Or because my parents had told me so. Or because the professors had told me so. Or because the pioneers had said so. Or even because the prophetess said so. Because Ellen White herself said, believe it because scripture says so. So some of you were around in the early 1980s where we struggled together, we prayed together, we wrestled together, we, we were on our knees a lot. And I'm thankful to tell you this side of that, that answers started coming. The, the Bible, as you went deeper and deeper, you found that there, there were answers to these questions. And I found that I had hoped just to have enough evidence to hang my doubts on and I'd stay an Adventist you know because I'd seen so much of how God had worked in this church but I found to my joy that I found more evidence than I dreamed there was richer beautiful evidence but then I found something else I wasn't even looking for I found that this doctrine was not only true but that it was beautiful and that it was all about Jesus and so I found Jesus in the sanctuary, Amen. and especially in the book of Hebrews. This is the book that uh, Desmond Ford, I've actually heard him give a lecture at, the, uh, at Loma Linda on how he, w w how he gave up the Adventist message of the sanctuary. Mm -hmm. And it was all about Hebrews. And his... His concept was, and we'll get to that in a minute, maybe we should just go there now. I'm not going to go through all of these slides. This is, a, this is a lecture that is probably not for a Sabbath afternoon after a wonderful lunch. So I'm not going to put you to sleep with this. But I'm going to go right to the heart of the part that actually deals with a question that to me was at the center of this whole, whole debate. Yeah. Do we have access? Yes, I will leave this. 
No, I'll leave this with Pastor Seth, and uh, you can make as many copies as you want. Yeah, so it's, it's all here in pretty much detail. And actually, you can go here if you like. You can go to uh, an article that is on my website. There's my website if you want to go, and you can find the whole article in which I go into de much more detail on it, so you can, you can see that. But, um, so we're not going to talk about the authorship of the book or the audience. That's... That's uh, basically the point of Hebrews as I see it is the author whom I take to be Paul, and I used to be kind of ashamed to say that Paul wrote it because a lot of people say, no, it wasn't Paul, until I ran into the leading world expert on the book of Hebrews. He's a Roman Catholic, and my colleague, who was a graduate from Andrews, went to a conference with Albert Van Waugh. He's written more books on the book of Hebrews than anyone alive. And my friend, Roberto Badenas, got to sit next to him at a banquet. And they'd gotten friends during the week of this conference, and he actually arranged for him to get fresh grape juice rather than the fermented grape juice. The sisters brought the fermented, and he got the... So they got to be quite good friends during the week. And finally, at the end of the week, he said, okay, this is my chance. So Badenus is sitting there next to him at this banquet, and he says, would you mind if I would just ask you a personal question? Who, who, do, you think, who do you think wrote the, the book of Hebrews? And he looked at him like, can I trust you with my deep and darkest secrets? <laughs> <laughs> he was just getting ready to retire, and he finally said to him, you know, I could never write this in public because that would be laughed. The critical scholars would never accept this, but I have no doubt in my mind that it was Paul that wrote this book. It's his theology, and it's his... You know, here's a guy that, uh, not an Adventist, not coming from our faith perspective. So, but I'm not, I'm not telling you what to believe about the authorship. That's not part of my lecture here. So, so uh, Paul is... I'm going to use Paul, all right? But you can substitute Barnabas or whoever else you think it might have been, Apollos, whatever. Uh, Paul was facing a bunch of uh, Jewish people in, in uh, probably maybe in, we don't know where he's writing to, but they were tempted to go back to Judaism. And so Paul is telling him, don't forsake Jesus, because if you forsake Jesus, where are you going to go? Yeah. Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. He's, you know, he's the better Jesus, the better Joshua, the better Moses, the better blood, the better covenant, the better priest, the better sanctuary, the better everything. Why would you want to forsake him? So, um, there are four main aspects of Hebrews and how it connects with Jesus. And here are the four. The first one is, what happened when Christ died? How did that fulfill the Old Testament typology? What does Hebrews have to say about Christ's death? The second one is, what happened when Jesus went back to heaven. Now, this is the main rub where Desmond Ford and evangelicals say, Adventists, you got it wrong. And then the third one is, uh, what did Jesus do when he went back to heaven? What did he start doing? What was his ongoing work there in the heavenly sanctuary? And uh, then finally, from the first per century perspective, what was Jesus going to do in the future? Was there some future work? We're going to focus on number two. That's the one that's the crucial one that makes a difference with what we believe. The other two we'll look at briefly, but uh, no one disagrees with this. When Christ died, he fulfilled all the typology of the sacrifices in the Old Testament. He was the Passover lamb. He was the Lord's goat of the Day of Atonement. He was the daily, the tamid sacrifice, he was the red heifer, he was the fulfillment of the bulls and the goats, he was the fulfillment even of the Day of Atonement. Even at the high point of Israel's history, you couldn't get forgiveness through animals' blood. It had to be through Jesus. So he was, he was the one that all the sacrifices coalesced and came together in him. Now, that's not unusual. We're not unique to believe that. Everyone that's a Christian theologian in Hebrews, I think, comes to that conclusion. So now what about this one? This is where it gets tricky. What did Jesus do 
when he went to heaven at his ascension. Was it, according to Adventists, our traditional position, he began his high priestly ministry in the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. That's what we have taught. That's what our pioneers have taught. So at his, at his ascension, he went up to start his holy place, high priestly, antitypical ministry. But then we have people like Albion Ballinger, who was a missionary from the States and went over to the British Isles. And he, while was there, and I don't know, I don't know the full story of how he developed his ideas, maybe talking to evangelicals over there in Great Britain, but he came up with the idea that no, Jesus didn't go to start his holy place ministry. He went to start the Day of Atonement ministry. He went straight to heaven to begin the antitypical Day of Atonement in 31 AD. And his key text, Hebrews 6, 19 and 20. Hebrews 6, 19 and 20. We can read this here briefly. This hope we have is an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, which enters the presence behind the veil, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. This phrase, behind the veil. Now, the tricky thing about the, the book of Hebrews is that it quotes from the Septuagint, the Greek Bible. The people that were receiving the letter from this author couldn't read Hebrew. And so he had to quote from the Bible they could read. The language of the people was Greek. So he quoted all of his quotations from Greek. So this phrase, behind the veil, in Hebrews 6, you go back to the Greek of the Old Testament, and that always means the veil between the holy place and the most holy place. So if he went behind the veil, the conclusion is, well, then he went into the most holy place to start his... And well, so who, what did you do when you went into the most holy place? You started the Day of Atonement ministry. Isn't that, isn't that what the priest would do every year? So the, so the deduction was, Jesus went up to heaven, went in behind the veil. So he was starting the Day of Atonement. Now, so what does that mean with regard to Adventist doctrine? If Jesus starts Day of Atonement in 31 A.D., what is, re what is left for 1844? Nothing. nothing. That's right, nothing. Now, Ballinger, for a while, he said, well, yeah, Satan was judged <laughs> starting in 18, but he couldn't find any text for that, and so he finally gave that up. So that's Ballinger. Then we got Desmond Ford, who basically, Desmond Ford had very few new ideas. He warmed up all the old arguments. Yeah. He warmed up Ballinger's ideas. But he used as his main text, as I heard him tell his story, he said, this text is the thing that made me not be able to be an Adventist anymore. Chapter 9, verse 12. Not with the blood of goats and calves, but within his, with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Here again, it's talking about entering. Entering once for all, and not with the blood of goats and calves. So goats and calves. When were there goats and calves offered? Day of Atonement. Day of Atonement, that's right. They offered a, a goat, the Lord's goat, and a calf. The, pre, the priest offered a calf for himself, a bull calf, and then the Lord's goat for the people. And then it says he went into the most holy place. So it's got to be Day of Atonement here. So De Desmond Ford said, see, when Jesus went back to heaven, he started the Day of Atonement. Else so there's nothing to do in 1844. The Adventists have just invented that as a faith-saving device because Jesus didn't come. They should have just given it up and accepted what all the other people believed. I don't know if you realize how serious this is, but if this is true, then... Why are we Adventists? Right. Why do we believe in October 22, 1844? And what, what is our reason 
for existence. I mean, we we're maybe just be a nice people with a nice culture and nice health message and we keep the Sabbath. And, but uh, you can find those in other churches. If you want to, if you want to f try to find someone that believes that Christ is engaged in a work of special judgment right now, it's only Adventists that believe that. So are we solid in that? Or is this, is this something we need to revise? Okay, so those were the thoughts that were going through my mind well, as I started out as a seminary professor. And I found a lot of answers for a lot of things to deal with the sanctuary. I found enough that I could say, hey, this, this, this has the ring of truth. But I didn't find a satisfactory answer for this. Not for a while. But I knew it had to be out there. And so I kept searching. It's got to be there. So what I want to do is tell you the story of how excited... I was at a woman's retreat. <laughs> My wife does lots of women's retreats. I think Joanne Davidson has been to practically every women's retreat in all of North America as well as Europe and so forth. And sometimes she allows me to come along. She gets permission from the leaders that I will stay in my room and not show up, <laughs> that I will hide. And maybe sometimes she can get a little food snuck into me. Or once in a while, if I'm really lucky, they'll even let me go for a meal. But most of the time, I'm locked in my hotel room for three days, which is not hard for me because I love to study. When I have time to study, no phones, can, no one can find me, and I can just dig into something. So this is what happened. Uh, this is the question that I was asking. When Christ ascended to heaven, was it to start the Day of Atonement, as Albion Ballinger claimed, or as Desmond Ford claimed? Or is there evidence for a different background that we haven't even thought about? So you start going, you start searching. All right, there's three places in Hebrews where you have Jesus going within the veil. We've talked about two of them. Hebrews 6 and Hebrews 9. But I, 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 did, I discovered there was a third place. Hebrews 10, verses 19 to 20, where you have a, a literary structure that combines all of these, and Bill Shea was very helpful in, in helping me see this because he did, a, he did this chiastic. You've heard of a chiasm? Has your pastor ever mentioned the name chiasm here? Okay, I, I don't like that name because I hate big names. I call it a Mount Rainier structure, okay? Mountain climbing structure. Because you go up one side, you know, and you have the certain life zones, and then you get up, and there's different life zones, and then there's the timber line, and then, you, the, and then you're finally at the top, and you go down the other side, and you meet those in reverse, right? So mountain climbing structure. And here you got the, this mountain climbing structure of A, the veil, Veil, 6, 19, and 20, 10, 19, and 20. These match each other. And scholars generally acknowledge that those are talking about the same thing. Same event. And then you've got priesthood, priesthood, sacrifice, sacrifice, sanctuary, sanctuary, covenant, covenant, sanctuary, sanctuary. And right here in the middle is 9, 12. Des Ford's favorite text. It talks about the heavenly sanctuary. So, Entering, entering, entering. Beginning, middle, end. You got the three entering passages. You see that? So now you go to this one, chapter 6. We've read that one. And it talks about going within the veil, but it doesn't say why he goes in there. It doesn't give you the reason. You have to infer maybe it's Day of Atonement because that's when they went into the second. But it doesn't say that explicitly. And then you go to Des Ford's and it talks about goats of bulls and uh, I mean blood of bulls and, and goats and most holy place but it doesn't explicitly say day of atonement maybe there's some other time that it went on so you have to infer so I wondered what about this third one 10 19 and 20 so let's go to this let's go to this third one and this is the structure I, I've already mentioned this uh, 
Scholars generally recognize that these two are past, talking about the same event, 6, 19, and 10, 19, and 20. So if this one doesn't tell me explicitly what's going on and why he went, maybe this one does. So scholars almost always say, well, the event is Day of Atonement. That's the background. When Jesus entered within the veil of the most holy place. But is the majority opinion always right? You wouldn't be Adventists if the majority opinion was always right. You'd be keeping Sunday. You'd be believing in spirit worlds and uh, survival after death and all the rest. We, we dare to believe out of the box when the Bible points us in that direction. And so I began to think, maybe there's another background here that we missed. Maybe it's not Day of Atonement. How can we know that? So let's see. So you go to, uh, oops, you go to Hebrews 10, 19 and 20. And let's read Hebrews 10, 19 and 20. Therefore, brothers, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is his flesh, Okay, we got the veil here mentioned, but we also have what he did. He went to consecrate the way for us. And he uses this word consecrate. It actually in Greek is the word enkinizo. And if you look up in a Greek lexicon, it can mean consecrate, but its more common meaning is to inaugurate. We have an inauguration every four years, right? We know what an inauguration is. It's where a serv uh, uh, someone starts up an office or s starts functioning in an office. He's inaugurated. And so this text tells us that Jesus went to heaven to inaugurate a way into the holy of holies. Now, let me just re make sure you caught one point I made a little bit earlier. What Bible is the author of Hebrews quoting from? The Hebrew Bible or the Greek? Greek? The Septuagint, the Greek. So we need to go back to the Septuagint, to the Greek, and see when is this word enkinizo used? What is he alluding to here? And when you go back to look at the Septuagint, you find that this word is used in this technical sense of inaugurate only once in the whole Pentateuch, the whole part that's talking about the sanctuary, it's only used once. In the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, that's right. Uh, throughout the Pentateuchal references to sacrifices, the word group Enkinizo is found in only one chapter. Now, if it was going to be Day of Atonement, what chapter would that be? Do you remember? Leviticus 16, so I was curious to see. Is that where it's found? Right. You look in Leviticus 16, no word enkinizo. It ain't there. So you go to the chapter where it is, found four times. And that chapter is Numbers chapter 7, which is not talking about Day of Atonement. It's talking about the inauguration services of the sanctuary to start up the services. And number seven actually says, after, after Moses had sprinkled with blood all the parts of the sanctuary, then they inaugurated the, the altar, the last thing that they did before they started up the services. So, whoa, suddenly I began to see that, hey, the evidence from the Greek is not pointing to Day of Atonement. It's pointing to inauguration service for what Jesus did when he went. The word enkinizo never is used to talk about Day of Atonement. Do you see that we're on this treasure trail? Then it's going to pay off. It gets even better. So when you... When you go back to Hebrews, let's say you didn't know about the Septuagint. All you had was the book of Hebrews. Well, the word enkindizo is used one more time in the book of Hebrews. And it's in 
chapter 10, I'm sorry, chapter 9 and verse 18. Let me read this section and you tell me, is this talking about Day of Atonement? Let me read this. Therefore, not, we, therefore, not even the first covenant was enkinizod, inaugurated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water, scarlet wool, hyssop, sprinkled both the book and the people and said, this is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. Then likewise he sprinkled with the blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. Is this Day of Atonement? No, no it's the inauguration service. It's when they had finished building the sanctuary, now they wanted to start up its services. And so they did it by anointing, by inaugurating, by enkinizoing all the parts of the sanctuary service. So, uh, Hebrews 10, 19 and 20, if it's parallel to Hebrews 6, 19 and 20, then they're both talking about the same thing. It means that Hebrews 6 is not talking about Day of Atonement. It's talking about when Jesus went in to inaugurate the sanctuary, which was what we've always said. He went back to heaven to start up the sanctuary services officially. You couldn't officially start up the sanctuary in heaven until the blood had been shed by Jesus. Animal blood can't be enough to start up the heavenly sanctuary. It had to be the blood of the new covenant, the everlasting covenant. Okay, so now, this is a fulfillment of Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. Remember Daniel 9? Seventy weeks are appointed for Messiah until he comes, and what will he do? The last thing it says he will do, he will anoint the most holy place. And so he's fulfilling that as before 34 AD, he has to do that. And this is 31 AD. He's fulfilling the anointing of the most holy place. So if someone asks me, well, what veil did he go through? Well, I'm not a specialist in heavenly geography. I've never been there. I don't know how many veils there are. If there's one, two, or three, it's okay. But you know, it doesn't matter which veil. Because, yeah, he is the veil. First of all, he, he's the fulfillment of the veil. And if there is, and I do believe there's a real place in heaven, but Jesus went through everything. He went to the very presence of the Father and broke down all the barriers through, in between. That's, you know, he, he's made a way of access for us into the very heart of the Father's house. He went through all the veils to do that. And so I don't get wrapped up in a debate over which veil is is because he went to all of them. Okay, Hebrews 9.12. This is Desmond Ford's favorite text. The blood of goats and calves. Now help me with this. We got bloods, blood of boats, goats, and calves. What does this refer to? I can still hear Des Ford blaring into my ears. If you have a goat, and you have a calf, and you have a most holy place, it's Day of Atonement. You can't have your Adventist doctrine. Okay, so well, let's, let's test it, okay? Let's test it. A goat and a calf, were they offered on the Day of Atonement? Yes, they were. Leviticus 16, verses 6 and 15. But now here's where it's nice to just, and this doesn't mean everyone has to know Hebrew and Greek, but sometimes if you want to really find out the truth about something, you've got to go to the original language. You know, it's like you're reading uh, some literary work and you're not quite sure what that poet said in German, you got to go back and read the German original to really get what the clue is. And so here we go to uh, ask the question, does, does Hebrews 9.12 refer to the Day of Atonement? So here I am now, I'm working this through in the women's retreat of my wife's, uh, and this happened at Gettysburg, 
Pennsylvania. Perfect place, yes. So while she was in there, <laughs> I was talking about the, the, I was studying about the blood of bulls and calves. Yes, okay. So I and I argue, no, it doesn't refer to Day of Atonement if you look at the Greek, if you look at the original. So let's go and find out how, how that works. Uh, the, the word for goat in Septuagint here, uh, that, that the author is using in Hebrews is tragos, tragos. And the word for calf is moskos. My dean at the seminary, his name is Moskala, and I always tease him that he is a, a, a bull calf, moskos and moskala. Anyway, he doesn't like that too well, but <laughs> helps him remember the word anyway. So, uh, and so in, this, in the Septuagint, in the LXX, in the Greek translation, there are, uh, there is the word moskos, and it's used, this word for calf, it's used for both the Day of Atonement and for the inauguration. So it doesn't help me. It doesn't help me to know which one he's talking about. But when you go to the word for goat in the Septuagint, there are two different words for goat. There's the word tragos, and there's the word kimaros. Both mean goat. They're synonyms. So now here's what, when I grew up, they had this TV program called the 60. $4,000 question, you remember that one? I think it needs to be now the $64 million question or billion dollar question, something anyway. And it would, they'd have that music playing ta -ta -ta -ta, as, the, as the guy was trying to think of the right answer to get his $64,000. So the music's playing in the background as I'm asking this question. Uh, which one of these, Kimaros or Tragos, is used for the Day of Atonement. Which one is used? Are you ready for your answer? Now, the stakes are high here. If it's tragos, that means he's pointing toward Day of Atonement. So I, with trembling, I had a new software that showed me all the texts in my Septuagint as I was doing this, and I clicked on it, boom! And it's Kemeros in Leviticus 16, not Tragos. Paul did not use the word that pointed to Leviticus 16. Instead, he used the word Kemeros, which, my friends, happens to be found in only one chapter of the whole Pentateuch. Guess which chapter? Number seven, the same one that has enkinidzo. And this time it's 13 times you've got the word kimaros. I'm sorry, tragos. Tragos, the goat. It was the special word for the inauguration goat. It was the only time it was used. So as I go and say, what is behind the mind of Paul as he's choosing words? He's choosing the inauguration word, not the Day of Atonement word. Do you get it? You see what I'm going to? Now, just in case, I always believe you've got to have two witnesses. You know, in the mouth of two or more witnesses, something's established. So we've seen it from the Septuagint. Now, let's go to Hebrews. Let's say we didn't have the Septuagint. So let's go and see, is there a possibility that Paul uses the word tragos one more time in, the sub, in, in Hebrews? Bing! He does. It's in Hebrews 9, 19, which we've already read. Let's read it again. Therefore, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood, for when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats, tragoi, tragos, plural, with water, scarlet wool, and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book and, its, and the people, and said, this is the blood of the covenant. You know when that happened? When they inaugurated the covenant in Exodus chapter 24. And then in chapter 40, where Moses took the blood and sprinkled all the, the, the Aaron was not yet anointed, so Moses was functioning as the priest, and he sprinkled the whole sanctuary, just like this says, using the blood of 
Tragos for the inauguration. I was getting excited, believe me. <laughs> but I had one more, one more thing that just sent me off to the, over the top. So basically, Hebrews 9.19 verifies as it uses the same two words, calves and goats, moskos and tragos, clearly in the context of the inauguration. So now we got this last word. I'm having trouble. Okay. In... Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12. Not the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered, now I'm reading the New King James Version here, he entered the most holy place. Hmm. And then I read Hebrews 6 and verse, I'm sorry, Hebrews 10, verse 19 and 20. Therefore Jesus, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Doesn't that sound like most, most holy place? So why is it just focusing upon the most holy place if during the inauguration he inaugurated the whole sanctuary? Why would he focus upon the most holy place? And that was where you have to look up this word tahagia. Tahagia. The term tahagia simply means the holy places. It's plural. It doesn't mean just one holy place. It means holy places. And it does not, as I found, there's 109 times that it's used in the Septuagint. I had, I had a busy weekend <laughs> because I had to look up and translate all of those 109 texts in their context to see what they had to say. And this word... Uh, Tahagia does not ever in all of the Greek writings of the Septuagint or of the Pseudepigrapha or the Philo or Josephus, any of the writings of the first century or first century BC, second century BC, any of those early Jewish writings, it's never used to describe the most holy place. I don't know why the translations want to put here most holy place. Some of them don't. Some of them actually translate as it should be translated. The sanctuary. It's the general term for the sanctuary as a whole. It refers, it appears 109 times referring to the whole sanctuary, 106 times, I'm sorry, 109 times it's used with regard to the sanctuary. 106 out of those 109, it refers to the whole sanctuary. Holy place, most holy place, the whole thing. Three times it refers to the, am I right, three? Three times it refers to the holy place because it has the three articles of furniture. So it's the holy things in the holy place. But never once does it refer just to the holy of holies. So it's not emphasizing Jesus going in at the day of atonement to the holy of holies. It's talking about him entering the whole sanctuary. So you find some versions, some of the modern versions actually say that. I think the New King James says the holy place a few times. So, the, yes. The English Standard Version says the holy places. Yes, that's, that's a good translation. It's everything, every place in the sanctuary is called that. Yeah, that's right. So it was at this moment, as I lo finished looking at the 109th reference that the women's retreat was over. Mm -hmm. And my wife came back from her last meeting to find me <clears throat> jumping on the bed like a trampoline. <laughs> boom, boom. And she says, what are you doing? You're going to kill yourself. You know, fall, fall off and hit your head on the nightstand or something. And I said, I am just so excited. I've been looking for an answer for this problem for years. It was the last major problem that I had, and it was the most difficult one of how to, talk, how to answer Ford. And it took me many, many weeks to calm down from that excitement. <laughs> In fact, I got back to class, to the sanctuary class that next week, and I was still pumped. You know, and I shared this with my students, and I, was, I must have been absolutely euphorically hypo, hyper, whatever. 
And one of my students there, good MDiv student, happened to be a guy by the name of Carl Cozart. <laughs> Ever heard of that guy? <laughs> and Carl Cozart left the seminary, finished his MDiv shortly after that, and went down to, I think, Texas to be pastor for a while. And he was, he was so excited by the idea. You know, I had, I had shown it jumping, jumping on a trampoline in a, in a hotel room. Someone needed to write this up. So he decided to write his MA thesis at, what was it, Nazarene, uh, Nazarene Theological Seminary. He wrote his thesis on this, not only looking at the Septuagint, but looking at the writings of Philo, the writings of Josephus, the writings of the Pseudepigrapha. He nailed it. He did a much better job than I did. I mean, you know, he did a thorough job showing once and for all the language of Hebrews is not pointing to Day of Atonement when Jesus went to heaven. Yeah. It's talking about him starting up the services of the, of, the, of the inauguration of the services. And so here's my summary of this. When Jesus entered the heavenly sanctuary, he entered it to inaugurate it, to officially start up the services as priest king. Now, just to still tell the, the rest of the story of this, I was then asked, well, there was a dialogue that took place in Andrews University Seminary Studies, which I don't like, I don't like to do debates in, in print. This is the only time I've ever been sucked into doing one of these things, because I don't like to debate my, my, my peers, especially seeing who's right or who's wrong. But I was, I was asked to do this, to publish this in the AUSS. And then they had a response by Des Ford's brightest pupil at Avondale College that wrote a reply to me. And then I got to write, write a reply back. And so his, his bait, one of his basic arguments was, was an interesting one. He used an illustration. He said... <coughs> Now, this is an Aussie writing, okay, from Australia, where they don't have winters like we have uh, in northern, northern uh, North America. But he said, imagine a Michigan winter with snow on the ground, and you have a gathering of, a family, of families they sing these wonderful songs together, and they eat a meal together, and they have this special winter celebration of, of the joy of the season. And they give gifts to one another. And uh, that's Christmas. I mean, you don't have to say the word Christmas to think Christmas. And so his argument was, if you say goat and calf in most holy place, you don't have to say Day of Atonement. It's Day of Atonement. Well, having looked at those other words and seeing it didn't point toward that, I came up with my own parable. What do you think of this? Okay, so I wrote, imagine a Michigan winter. It is the month of December. It is the 25th day of the month. Are you with me? And there's the giving of gifts and the singing of spirited songs. And then there is the lighting of the Hanukkah candle. The Hanukkah is in December and it's the 25th day of the Jewish month. I didn't say it was December but I don't have a Christmas tree. I have a Hanukkah that I light to remind myself of the Jewish uh, miracle that happened. I say, if you have all of these things, then if you have Christmas tree, it's Christmas. If you have Hanukkah, then it's Hanukkah. And if you have Enkainidzo, <laughs> and you have Tragos, <laughs> and you have Tahagia, I'm not in Christmas, I'm in Hanukkah. And so 
it makes the difference what you see by the meaning of these words. Does that make sense to you? Anyway, so uh, that's basically what I wanted to tell you about this. I'll just quickly go over the other things. Uh, the, the idea of he sat down at the right hand of the Father, some are troubled by that, that that means he's locked into the Holy of Holies. No, the word to sit down at the right hand of someone in the Hebrew Bible doesn't mean location. It's a term for status. Like we use, this is my right-hand man. Doesn't mean he's always here. So to sit at the right hand of someone is to be reigning with them. Solomon was standing up as he was giving his prayer at the dedication of the temple, and he was saying, I am sitting on the throne of my father David. People that would look around would say, hey, you're not sitting, you're standing. It's not space. It's, it's, um, it's, it's a symbol of, of uh, function. Yeah, function. How do I know that? Because this is a quotation from Psalm 110, where the Messianic Psalm says, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. And in verse 2, the Father is sitting at the Son's right hand, and in verse 5 it reverses it, and the Son is sitting at the Father's right hand. If that was literal, that's impossible. I can't sit at your right hand and you sit at my right hand at the same time. Not literally, but functionally, if it means that we're reigning together. The Father and the Son were ruling together. You see that? And so Jesus is not locked into some room in the Holy of Holies or some part of the heavenly sanctuary. I believe there was a wonderful inauguration service and it maybe took place in the Holy of Holies as he was anointed with the holy anointing oil and, uh, and he was established as a priest king of the universe. But then he was free to go wherever he goes as king, he, to, as priest, to do whatever he does. Don't, ter don't turn a functional description into literalistic description. And then... Uh, so that's about that one. And then when we go to the first century, we find that there's nothing said about Jesus acting as judge in the first century. What is he doing in the first century? Hebrews 7, verse 25 says, he ever lives to make intercession. He's doing his intercessory ministry. That's the holy place ministry, exactly as Adventists have taught. And then finally, what about his future work? What was Jesus going to do from the perspective of the first century, what was his future work going to be? Look at this. Look at Hebrews 9, verses 23, 27. Our pioneers quoted from this, where Jesus' um, work is described in the future, still ahead from the perspective of Paul. I'll just read verse 27. And as it was appointed for men once to die, but after this, the judgment. Was the judgment happening in the first century? No. no. Paul sees it as still future. In fact, look at this text here, Hebrews 10, 25 to 31. Um, as I read these verses, tell me whether it's present or future. Hebrews 10, 20, I'll start with 26. If we sin willfully after we've received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains the sacrifices for sin but a certain fearful expectation of judgment. It's future, right? And fiery indignation will devour the adversaries. That's for God's enemies. That's the executive judgment. What about the investigative? Listen to the next line. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. That's the investigative. That's the bad news. For people who don't accept the gift of salvation, they get what they choose. And who are being judged? Verse 30. For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. Will. So we have future, investigative, followed by executive, God's professed people, isn't that what Adventists are teaching right now? All those things that Paul still saw as future are now happening. So to cap it all off, this text that we often use to try to get people to come to church on Sabbath, 
uh, chapter 10, verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another so much the more as you see the day approaching. What's that? The day. Well, some say day of atonement or, I mean, day of the Lord. Could be the day of the Lord. But you know, in Paul's day, the, the, the commentary on the day of atonement had a chapter called day of atonement, but its title was the day. That was the shorthand for the Day of Atonement. And so it seems to me very likely that Paul is saying, as we're getting nearer and nearer the antitypical Day of Atonement when this judgment is going to take place, get together, press together, encourage one another. So there's language of Day of Atonement. So I argue that the basic contours of sanctuary typology in Hebrews are the same as in Daniel. They're the same in Leviticus. Yeah, Hebrews doesn't tell us 1844, but it gives us all the thumbprints of exactly what we're teaching. And it puts it in the context of the gospel, of what Jesus is doing for us. In fact, that far, what I've just shared with you is what I used to share, and then I would stop when I talked about Hebrews. Well, now we see what Jesus did. We traced him through his, his death, his ascension and going to heaven to start up the heavenly ministry and then his holy place ministry and now his judgment ministry. Isn't it beautiful? But that's just the beginning of the message of Hebrews. Mm -hmm. The message of Hebrews is not so much about geography of where Jesus is, but about where he wants us to be with him. And so this last part that I add when I share this now is my favorite part. It's the same text we've used, but it has a different slant. It's not where is Jesus, but where does Jesus want us to be? And look at this. I mean, the practical mes message of the book of Hebrews is we can, by faith, be with him in the heavenly sanctuary right now. By faith. Amen. Look at these four texts. Look at Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. You probably memorized this. Let us now come, bo uh, bo yes, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Doesn't say let's go to our closet, even though that's where by faith you may go to the heavenly sanctuary, but his emphasis is come, come to the heavenly sanctuary. By faith, come to the throne of grace. Where's God's throne? Heaven. It's in his heavenly temple. And he says, come on up, boldly, to find help and grace in time of need. Go back, go to Genesis, or, uh, chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. This hope we have as an, in, as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. This hope we have, which enters behind the veil. Not only has Jesus gone there, but he wants us to go there to penetrate with hope through the veil by faith. And then it gets even better. Look at 1019. We read this also, but now let's see what he wants us to do in connection with him. Therefore, brothers and sisters, having boldness to enter the sanctuary, to Hagia, which means the whole sanctuary, by the blood of Jesus. Verse 22, and let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Have you done that today? Have you gone to the heavenly sanctuary? You know, this isn't just some game. I think God is giving us a paradigm of how to survive in this world. You got some neighbor that bugs you? You got some church member that challenges you? <laughs> you got a problem you can't solve? There's this ad that used to be going all the time on TV, that Southwest Airlines ad. You know, someone's in someone else's house and they're using the restroom and they decide they want to look in their, you know, their cupboard, their medicine cabinet. And they open it and everything falls out, you know. And then the 
the ad comes on. Want to get away? You know? <laughs> and I, I, when I look at that ad, I think about this text. So many things are happening, and I, I don't know how to deal with it. Want to get away? God says, come on. Come on up to my place. My home is yours. Come on up by faith. And then I've saved the best text for last. Hebrews 12, verses 22 to 24. But you have come to Mount Zion. Does that say will or have? That's the perfect tense. It means you have done it and you're there. You stay there. You have come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, which we saw in our sermon this morning was going to be turning into the Holy of Holies, going to be turning into the sanctuary, the holy city, and the innumerable company of angels to the general assembly, assembly and church of the firstborn and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. The message of Hebrews is hope. In this messed up world, there's too much here that we can't bear. And God says, you don't have to. You want to get away? Come on home for a while. In fact, why don't you make this your faith home? So I like to suggest that we have a new paradigm about the sanctuary. Not just a doctrine. It's not just a doctrine. I'd like to suggest that it's not just even sanctuary prayer. Carol Zarska taught this going through the sanctuary in prayer and every on your devotions, working your way through the sanctuary and stop and pausing and meditate. That's good. That's not enough. I'm calling for what I call sanctuary life. What good is this doctrine if it doesn't make a difference in our life? If it doesn't give us a new window into Jesus' character? And here is Jesus saying through this doctrine, you've got a home already there, and it's yours to come, and actually by faith you can live there, an escape cabin, a place to get away in my, in my father's house. And one of these days I'm going to come and take you, and you can be there forever. But even now, you can come as often as you need. You can even live there by faith. Isn't that cool? It, it turns the sanctuary into something wonderful, this experience that we get to have. So now, talk to me. Okay. Yes? So is the heavenly sanctuary the holiest of holies? Is that it? No more veil to go through? Yeah, there's, there's a difference of opinion on that, and I don't have a strong insistence to try to say it's one or the other. Uh, I tend to still think that there are special places in this spatial temporal reality in heaven, not because they're barriers, but because in a home you have a living room and you have a dining room and you have a kitchen because that's places where special things happen. And then you have your study. At least I have my study. That's where my work takes place. And, and it's not that, I, not that it's a barrier to block things out, but God has his, his place where he sends out his angels for ministries of mercy and then he invites us to sit at his table and fellowship. And so those, whatever barrier, whatever uh, uh, divisions there are, there are no more barriers. Mm -hmm. They're so just... Through my faith, I'm there. You're there, straight through. There's no, 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 no blocking, no blocking, no. But if you want to stop and pause at the table and eat a little food <laughs> on your way into the Holy of Holies... He just opens his whole home to us. He, that's right. That's what I'm saying. This is his home. And his home happens to have a judgment room where he does his work, like the White, Hall, White House has that oval office where the work is done. But they also, he says, look, I don't want you just to have to come to the oval office. Come on into my, into my living quarters. Enjoy the whole White House. Enjoy the whole whatever. So if we get that paradigm, it doesn't matter to me how many rooms there are, what, what, it's, it's kind of like he has a special place just for us to talk to us. And then he has a special place where he's, he's doing this affirmative judgment and meeting the charges of Satan. And it's kind of cool to think of. He has designated locations in order to win the battle of this great controversy.
So, yes. What did Ellen White mean then that we're now living in the Day of Atonement? Isn't that what Ford was trying to tell us? Not that I agree with him, but... Yeah. Well, I think since 1844, we are. Okay. He was trying to say it started in 8031. Yeah. So, ever since, I think for every festival, Passover, once Jesus died, we're now living in Passover till the end. Christ, our sacri Passover sacrifice, has been slain. Pentecost, pouring out of the Holy Spirit, started with the early rain, and now we're in the la nearing the latter rain phase. It's, so we're still living in that. And so when Day of Atonement, or, or the, uh, the Feast of Trumpets, the blowing of the first angel's message, we're still given the message. We're still in that. When Day of Atonement started, we're still in that <coughs> till the end. Does that make any sense? Yeah. Anyone else? I think that when Christ died, yes. I think the reason that he died uh, because it was such a or horrific thing is because he had that perfect sanctuary experience yes. with the Father here on earth. Yes. And he didn't have to experience separation until he had to take on our sin. And so then because of that, it was that, that mental struggle. That is beautiful. Beautiful. And he, he had... Deal with it. Yeah. And so, yeah, he was... God was ripped from God for us, basically. Yeah. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yes. Yes. If Edmund Ford still active, he is. He is retired from his place in Northern California where he ran his Good News Unlimited. He moved back to Australia and he is still lecturing, still hasn't seen light in anything to do with the sanctuary. I mean, he still believes, I think, in justification by faith like we do, but he, he I think he, w I think he must maybe was raised with this legalistic view of the judgment that some of us were raised with in the 50s, that, that it, you can't be sure of salvation. And, and, this, and he, he caricatures the judgment message because rightfully seen, the judgment message is, is perfectly in harmony with the gospel. Mm -hmm. And so uh, my friend uh, Roy Gain is an Australian, Aussie, teaches with me, and he and Des Ford are in communication, and they're... I still, in fact, when I teach the doctrine of the sanctuary, when I, 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 I make it a point, I made a... Uh, at, at Pastor Seth's uh, uh, insistence, I broke a fundamental rule that I do in my classroom, that I don't ever mention persons by name from my classroom. I felt that what I was doing here was more policy rather than theology and so I dared to mention some names which I hope you will not think when I'm what I said in Sabbath school that I was saying anything negative about my church or about my friends that I love with my heart we have an honest difference on this and God's gonna see us through and we're not I'm not gonna lose friends over this no. and I'm, nor am I going to I'm not gonna take it to that level and so if that if you got that idea from this morning I didn't intend that but Des Ford is a known name. Everyone knows the Des Ford controversy that, that, that's, that's been around. <laughs> yes, okay. So every time we come to this subject, we have a prayer season in our classroom. And we kneel down and we spend 15, 20 minutes praying for Des Ford. I actually learned the gospel better I told you about my experience this morning, but then I came back to the seminary and he had a week of prayer there. But when he was still a good Adventist, on justification by faith, and it just, it just warmed my heart. And I, I, I longed for him to come back to be preaching those wonderful messages, those Adventist messages. You know, the, the best answer to Des Ford is Des Ford's own book. He wrote a book on Daniel in which he answers all the things which he objects to later. All you have to read is his previous book, and he answers all of the things like that he... Darwin Darwin. Yeah, <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. So I, I pray for him. That he, and I'm not saying he's going to be lost. I, I can't judge it. But I long to hear him preaching powerful Adventist sermons. I know he's getting up in age, but um, 
It's a problem of pride, I think, more than anything else. Uh, there's a story that I guess I can tell publicly that uh, his, um, his friend, good friend, Edward Heppenstall, who used to teach at the seminary, was very instrumental in, in uh, he and Des Ford in convincing Robert Brinsmead to shift away from his perfectionistic and to get into a gospel-centered orientation. So they worked close together, and then, and then Des Ford went beyond uh, Heppenstall and started teaching this stuff, crazy stuff about the sanctuary. And so one Sabbath for lunch, the Heppenstalls invited the Fords for Sabbath dinner. This was after Ford had already gone out and started his own thing. And so Mrs. Heppenstall is very, was very forthright. <laughs> <laughs> and so she, uh, while, the, while Des was chewing on his peas, uh, she asked him, uh, you know, sometimes I read your writings and I listen to you speak and I think you're, you're, you're talking like a pope. Like you never can make a mistake. And he got really offended. He said, what do you mean? I make thousands of mistakes. But then he looked at her, but never in theology. And I think that tells the tale. When I go to Australia and I talk to the conference presidents there, or I've walked with this Ford and tried to share some of this with him, and you usually get about 15 seconds at the most, and then you're cut off. I tried to share some of this with him, and he, he listened for about 15 seconds, and then he said, that'll never wash, and he walked away. So it's going to take the Holy Spirit really penetrating a thick skin of, of pride. But I still think there may be a chance. So I'm going to pray as long as he's alive. God, bring, bring him to our to back. The, nothing better could happen is if Des Ford would come back and say, look, I led you down a wrong path, but this is the truth. This is beautiful. Take it. So I pray for it. I pray for it often. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Um, what do we got? We got 420. We were supposed to be done at 430, right? So uh, would you mind if I just gave you a short version of something more light than this? Sure. You can stand up for a couple minutes. Okay. And then I want to just give you a little taste of of what our Hebrew brothers and sisters enjoyed when they went to the sanctuary. Okay. Okay? okay? We won't do a long version of it, but just enough to give you a little taste of celebration of sanctuary. Okay. All right, I'm going to go get a drink. And then, I guess I got my cup glass here. Okay, the reason I asked you that earlier. Yes. Verse 